Good evening. This is Real Talk, History as a Weapon for Black Liberation, and I'm your host, Dr. Sundiata Kaita Chajua. And today my guest is Malik Yakini. He is the co-founder and executive director of Detroit Black Food Security Network. DBCFSN operates a seven-acre farm in Detroit and spearheaded efforts to establish the Detroit Food Policy Council, which Mr. Yakini chaired from December 2009 to May 2012. He served as a member of the Michigan Food Policy Council from 2008 to 2010, and from 2011 to 2013, served on a steering committee of Uprooting Racism, Planting Justice. He is also co-founder of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, and from 1990 to 2011, he served as executive director of the Nassau Roma Institute Public School Academy, one of Detroit's leading African-centered schools. And in fact, in 2006, he was honored as Administrator of the Year by the Michigan Association of Public School Academies. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including the prestigious James Beard Leadership Award. Yakini is a musician who plays guitar, bass, and the dum-dum drums. He currently leads the Detroit-based band Maliwa. He has traveled to Ghana, Mali, Senegal, Gambia, Cote d'Ivoire, Jamaica, Italy, France, Spain, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. He is the father of three and the grandfather of one, a vegan and an avid organic grower. Brother Yakini, it is uh, a pleasure to have you on Real Talk. Um, You know, let let, let me say that we try and keep it informal in this space, in this space. So it's first name and brother and sister. Um, You know, before we go much further, I want to say how much I have appreciated and admired your work. You know, I, I. I've, I just met you in October, but I've known about you and your work for well more than a decade, maybe 15, 20 years or more, uh, mainly from uh, Dr. Monica White, whose uh, wedding we attended in Puerto Rico a couple months ago. So again, it's, it's a pleasure. Now, I want to urge you to walk this razor's edge of being both comprehensive but also succinct. Um, I'm the kind of guy, as you know from our talking, I will interrupt. Um, Sometimes I'm trying to push you because of time considerations, right, toward a conclusion. Sometimes I'm trying to seek clarification. And sometimes I'm I'm trying to challenge you, to, to, to force you to look at something maybe from a different angle. So now, I'm a devotee of uh, Bill Cross and the negrescence uh, or the process of Negro to Black conversion. So I always begin with biographical questions. So what I want you to do is uh, discuss what they call in psychology critical incidents in your development of political and social consciousness. So now you were born in Detroit. Both your fraternal and maternal grandparents migrated to Detroit from the South. I think the fraternal side is from Southwest Georgia and the maternal yeah. side from Arkansas. So in a piece called Guts, a story of personal transformation, you talk about the time period in which you matured in Detroit, what was going on in Detroit. You talk about your family, your class background, and how these things influenced your, your your intellectual choices. What I'd like you to do, as you did in that piece, is kind of, one, talk about the significance of the title, right? Guts, a, a personal, let me get it right. Is it personal journey? Guts, a story of personal transformation. And so can you talk about specific experiences, observations, mentors, readings, and processes that contributed to your intellectual development 
and political engagement? Sure, uh, I, I'll do the best I can do. So first, let me say that one thing that black nationalists are not usually known for is brevity. Uh, we tend, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to try. <laughs> uh, especially, uh, especially all black nationalists, uh, we've been accused of taking up all the all the air in the room. So I'm going to try not to do that. Um, but uh, I wrote a piece called Guts because in some ways, uh, my transfer the transformation of my diet in some ways parallels the transformation of my consciousness. And just to try to give you a brief version of that piece I wrote, um, in 1969, I was 13 years old. And in many traditions, that age period is the time when you're moving from uh, childhood into young adulthood. And usually uh, those children moving into the adulthood are trying to kind of find their own individual identity trying to find out what is it about them that might be unique. Sometimes your handwriting changes around that time as you're trying to find kind of your voice and your signature in the world. So I was very fortunate that around that time in 1969, when I was 13, uh, I was growing up in Detroit. And Detroit in many ways was a hotbed of black consciousness during that time period. Uh, and in fact, during all of the last century, Detroit was a hotbed of black consciousness and activism, but particularly in the period from 1965 or so to 1969, uh, it was particularly a hotbed of consciousness. And of course, during that time period in 1967, the rebellion occurred in Detroit, which was uh, the bloodiest of the many rebellions that occurred in the 1960s in the city of Detroit. Many organizations sprung up during that time period and there were many efforts on community levels to raise people's consciousness. And so I was fortunate to be going to a school, a post junior high school, where a number of teachers at the school were themselves young and radical and activist. And so, for example, the gym teacher at the school was the Michigan coordinator for the Angela Davis Defense Fund. And she, oh. had, a big, she had a big Afro like Angela Davis. The auditorium teacher was named Gloria Green, and she was crowned the first Miss Black America. And then I had these other two teachers, Ronald McCombs and Mel Keys, who had both a few years before moved to Detroit from West Virginia, and they were childhood friends who were both teaching in the same school. And they were both very radical in their thought. And so they often combined their classes together. McCombs was my social study teacher. Peters was my English teacher. Sometimes they would combine their classes together and either have a speaker or show a movie or have a film or something like that. And so on one of these occasions in January 1969, they played Malcolm X's message to the grassroots. And so in my life, I can probably uh, divide my life into two eras, the era before mm -hmm. hearing that and everything that has occurred after hearing that speech. So that speech helped to define the trajectory of the rest of my life, including, and this is the reason it's called Guts, up until that point, my very food in the world was chitlins. And my mother made them mm. once a year, on New Year's Day. And I used to love to have them with uh, Frank's red hot sauce on them. And I, I loved them. And then I heard Malcolm X, chitlins in a historical and cultural context and talk about the fact that our enslaved ancestors ate them because that's what was cast off by the so-called slave master. So for the very first time, I began to think about food in a historical and social and cultural context beyond just whether or not I like the way it tasted. And so it began to shift my diet. At the same time, it began to shift my consciousness as a young black boy moving into manhood in America. Can, can I interject something? Can, what was it about, I mean, first of all, you described an experience that I think speaks to our generation. And, and, and actually, the, the generations behind us, the millennials for sure, that Malcolm, either reading the autobiography or listening to Message to the Grassroots, or um, the ballot or the bullet become seminal experiences in your 
political journey. But what specifically hit you? Because you described a profound transformation in your life, including in your diet. What, what, what hit you from that, from the message to the grassroots? I would say there's several things that hit me as a result of that. One, and again, keep in mind, I'm 13 in Detroit growing up and trying to figure out what does it mean to be a young black man? How do I survive in my environment? And the school I went to wasn't an easy school either. I say, when I say easy, I mean in terms of, you know, there was gang culture, there was a lot of fights, there was, you know, and so I'm trying to figure out how do you navigate all of this and how do you be cool and have the esteem of your classmates and, you know, all of this. I'm trying to figure all this out as a 13 year old. And so one of the things about hearing Malcolm X's message to the grassroots was the fearlessness that he had as he was talking about the system of white supremacy. And so as somebody trying to define what did manhood mean or trying to find images of what I would become as a black man, in many ways, Malcolm represented that kind of masculinity. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as I look back at my life, I mean, that's a double-edged sword, I think because I think, you know, myself and a lot of other activists in our pursuit of what we thought was masculinity, that kind of strong militant uh, image in, in some ways became distorted also. But initially as a 13 year old, definitely that had a huge attraction to me. The second thing that attracted me was Malcolm's profound understanding of history and how the history of the last 500 years converged and impact the black man, woman, and child in the United States of America. And so I had never heard anybody with that kind of grasp of, mm -hmm. of, of history and able to explain our condition by situating it within history. Um, the third thing I think attracted me to Malcolm was he was just extremely articulate. And yeah. uh, <laughs> He spoke with great confidence and, um, I, you know, I was tremendously inspired by that. In fact, we literally used to memorize like that message to the grassroots, me and my friends, we memorized that whole speech. We could recite the whole thing mm -hmm. word for word because we kind of studied it. And so, you know, the, many the things about you that. really studied something with that level of diligence. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think there's anything before that that really struck my interest like that. But but again, to keep in mind, part part of it you could call a study, but part of it was youthful emulation of this image of manhood that I saw, right? Yeah, yeah, so I'm yeah, not yeah. sure if study was even the right word for it. It was more just trying to you, you know trying to align myself, you know, I me trying to black man through quoting Malcolm and through trying to in some ways mimic what I understood him to be. So would it be fair to say that um, your early political perspective could be characterized as cultural nationalism, maybe even Kawaita mm. or something? I, I don't, I certainly don't want to put myself in that box. Uh, and I'll say that that was one of the early influences on me, but also, uh, maybe ironically, uh, equally, or maybe a larger influence at that time was the Black Panther Party. And so, uh -huh. and so in fact, before I even heard of Kawaita, Karenga, well, well, actually I heard of them because of reading the Panthers, but before I became really familiar with Kawaita and Karenga's doctrine, I was studying uh, the Panthers and, you know, became familiar with them through their characterization of Karenga and the US organization. Uh, but but certainly uh, cultural nationalism had some influence on me. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, the, the some of the things of Karenga I think have great value, although I'm, I wouldn't consider myself a, Karenga, a Karengaite, and I've tried to see the value in some of the things that he has brought forward to our community in spite of himself. Um, for example, I think Kwanzaa has value that mm -hmm. supersedes whatever uh, Karenga's deficiencies 
uh, might be. So I think, you know, I, I think Karenga, Karenga is both a brilliant and in some ways problematic. But uh, that was one influence. But, you know, Karenga's well, the influence. I raised that, though, was because of the, I, I know that Haki Mahabute had some influence on you. Yeah. And that would have been his perspective. But yeah. maybe, yeah. like with me, it was his poetry that influenced yeah. me, not necessarily his broader political thought. Yeah, Haki Madabuti was a major influence on me from about 1975 when I first met him. And I guess I was 19 in 1975. And certainly at that time, he was very much immersed in the Kawaita doctrine. Uh, and, and again, that had some influence on me. But I've always had, I've always been a critical thinker. And frankly, I don't think I fit uh, cleanly into any one particular box. Okay. Uh, I've always been an advocate of, uh you know that we can be eclectic uh you know we don't have to choose uh du bois or or petite right? you don't have to i don't think get caught up in that dialectic there's something that booker t has to offer that has value there's some things that du bois has to offer that has value and similarly i think in the type of cultural nationalism espoused by karenga and in many ways uh, brought to actualization by mary baraka there's many important lessons in that. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I think there's many important lessons in the type of revolutionary nationalism and internationalism that the Black Panther Party brought forward. So I don't think it's a question of either or. I've been influenced by both of those things. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would agree with you that at the end of the day, we pick and choose, but there is a question of proportions, right? But you, you're in Detroit, man. What about the league? Any interaction, direct influence from the League of uh, Revolutionary Black Workers and their yeah. uh, emphasis on uh, organizing at the point of production? Yeah, interestingly, uh, so I mentioned I went to the school post junior high school. And in 1969 and 1970, something called the Citywide Black Student United Front, which was a result of all these kind of smaller black student associations mainly at high schools in the city that were having walkouts and what have you. And they decided to unite under this kind of bigger umbrella called City of Black Student United Front. And so uh, through my involvement in post, I was part of that. Then also in my first year in high school, I was in the Black Student Association. It was part of this citywide organization. And we had a newsletter that was distributed among all the schools who were members of it. But what I didn't know at the time, and I found out just maybe within the last five years or so, is that newsletter was produced at the office of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers on their mimeograph machine. And that's what it was used at that time, mimeograph machines. Yeah. And so <laughs> and even many of the slogans that the Citywide Black Student United Front used to use, such as Dare to Struggle, Dare to Win, and Victory is for the Daring, those slogans that we were using came directly out of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. So the League had a tremendous influence on me, even though I didn't know at the time that's where that influence was coming from. Yeah, I was going to say, because, uh, you know, as a historian, I, I'm, I'm under the belief that the League organized the citywide unification of the Black student chapters at the various high schools, that that was a League project, but that they gave the young people the space to do it themselves. So you probably never really saw the League people, but they, they had put that piece in place. And in, in all fairness, I wasn't a leader. I was a foot soldier, right? You know, I'm, I'm a 13, 14 year old foot soldier kind of following the lead of people who are in the 12th grade and, you know, two, three, four years older than me. So I, I wasn't, I didn't know all the inner workings. I was the young soldier who wanted to help make the revolution. Yeah, I mean, given the age, I, I, I fully understand. Um, Detroit, uh, uh, you know, I guess people would say that New York was a nationalist town. Detroit has always been a kind of black radical town, but there's just a, a plethora of uh, militant and, and radical nationalist activity. So we've talked about the league, um, and we've talked about other forces. Can you say the the Panthers in Detroit? Can you say something about any interaction with the Republic 
New Africa, Shrine of the Black Madonna. Because, I mean, Detroit is like a cauldron of, of, uh, of, of radical surgeons in that yeah, period. Well, well, I'll start with the Shrine. I said, um, my, my paternal grandparents. But can you tell our listeners, can you tell them what the Shrine of the Black Madonna was? Sure. The Shrine of the Black Madonna was and is officially a church is actually known as the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church. And it was organized by um, um, uh, Reverend Albert B. Albert B. Clegg, who was an activist minister and a very radical activist minister in the city of Detroit, who often was at odds with people like C.L. Franklin, who represented the more conservative elements of the civil rights movement. And uh, so in 1967, um, the church that uh, Albert Clegg was minister at transformed itself into what they called the head of the Madonna. They unveiled a big painting of a black woman holding a black Jesus, um, which is what the church gets its name from. It introduced a black liberation theology uh, he subsequently wrote a couple of books like Christian Nationalism, and I'm forgetting the name of his second book, um, but was also a major player uh, in all of the kind of radical black politics happening in Detroit, uh, both before, during the period of the 67 rebellion and immediately following the rebellion. Uh, the church became a center of radical activity. For example, during the 1967 rebellion, there was an incident that was memorialized in a movie a few years ago called the Algiers Motel Incident, where, oh, yeah, the, police, yeah. where the police came in and murdered two brothers who were in a hotel room with some white women. And there was a community tribunal that was organized by Dan Aldridge, and it was held at the Shrine of the Black Madonna. All of the major I heard players. Dan Aldridge. Yes. For Dan our Aldridge. listeners, who is Dan Aldridge? And the role that he played in Detroit radical politics and uh, as a music um, um, well, manager. Well, Dan Aldridge is still around, so I don't want to talk about people in the past tense about what he was. <laughs> he's, he's still yeah, he's who very, is a very vibrant member of our community uh, who recently organized the Detroit Jazz Orchestra Plus, which has had concerts over the last year or so. And he's always promoting jazz music in particular, uh, but good black music in general. Uh, but uh, Dan Aldridge was the head of the Detroit Friends of SNCC in the 1960s. And his wife, Dorothy Dewberry Aldridge, was actually a member of SNCC, who had been active in, uh, in Alabama with, uh, with a number of other SNCC members. And uh, Dan was also involved in a number of other radical black activities in Detroit in the late 1960s and 70s and was really just seen as a key figure in the black uh, political radical landscape. So he organized this tribunal uh, to, to try these police officers who had assassinated these two brothers in the community, of course, found them uh, guilty. And so, you know, that doesn't have much impact in the real life, except it's like street theater that shapes and molds people's consciousness. Uh, mm -hmm. So the Shrine was the scene of that, but also people like uh, uh, Stokely Carmichael, later Kwame Ture, spoke at the Shrine of the Black Madonna. Uh, members, uh, two, two of the key members, or two of the key founders of the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa, Imari Obadele and uh, Gaidi Obadele, uh, formerly uh, Richard Henry and Milton Henry, were members of, of that church as well. As, was, as was Ed Vaughn and Kwame Atta, who went on to become the key founders of the Pan-African Congress. So in a sense, the three major Black nationalist Pan-Africanist organizations in the 70s in Detroit all kind of grew out of that church. The Shrine of the Black Madonna mm. itself and the Black Christian Nationalist Movement, the Pan-African Church USA, and the Provisional Government of the Republic of New Africa. So they were all in league with each other. They were all friends. They all had influences. And I'll just end by saying that uh, I had a first cousin 
who in the late 60s was a member of the shrine. And so I was familiar with them and their philosophy early on um, in terms of the Republic of New Africa. When I left post high school in January of 1971 and went to high school at Cass Technical High School in Detroit, my roommate and best friend and locker partner was a brother named Jeribu Shahid, who was a member of the Republic of New Africa. In fact, his sister, his older sister, was married to Imari Obadele's son. And so he was almost in the family. And so he really began to expose me more deeply to the teachings of the Republic of New Africa, which frankly, I was already familiar with. And I'll end the answer on this by saying that Imari Obadele lived in my neighborhood. He lived four blocks from me. <laughs> I, went school, I went to elementary school with his son, who uh, we call him Ray Two. And my mother worked at the local post office in the neighborhood. She was a clerk at the window. And Imari had his book out, the early 70s, War in America. And he used to bring it to the post mm -hmm. office and, you know, package them up and have them mailed out around the country. So it, I had a very close relationship also. This was something that was right in my neighborhood. People that I knew, you know, I went to school with his son. We had interaction. So this wasn't something that was far away. This was something that, Helped to define the Detroit that I came yeah. of age in. Okay, yeah, no, that, that's that's an amazing story, and I guess that's what a place like Detroit gives you. You know, I, I must say I I knew Amari and uh, worked with him in Mississippi for a while. Uh, but let me, I, I want to raise a question about food because. Um, I don't know if you've read Sterling Stuckey's book, Slave Culture, The Foundations of Nationalist Theory. You know, I have it and I've had it since the 1970s. I don't think I ever read it cover to cover. Okay. Well, one of the things about it, and I mean, obviously there's a lot of stuff in it, but one of the things that I was always struck by is that he makes this argument that, now granted the book comes out in the mid eighties, but he says that African Americans basically eat what Africans in West Africa ate in the 15th century. He says same diet. So what he describes is the role of rice, okra, black-eyed peas, mustard and collard greens, yam, kidney and lima beans, peanuts, millet, sorghum, licorice, watermelon, and sesame. And what what what's called fufu. You know, in, 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 in a particular ethnic culture in Nigeria, we call pancakes, and he talks about gumbo and barbecue techniques. And so just thinking about that, that these are, that we largely consume even today, food stuff that our ancestors brought with them from the continent. Can you just kind of, do you think our people understand that very basic Africanity of our, of our historic diet? And does it mean something? So I think there's many aspects of our culture that we don't connect to our Africanity, but nonetheless uh, exist. And food is certainly one of those. And, you know, I've had a chance to travel a bit through the African world and have been able to see the similarities. And there are certainly similarities, whether you're in the Caribbean, whether you're on the African continent, whether you're among so-called African-Americans. And, you know, I think two things have happened that we have maintained certain cultural traits and memories, and mm -hmm. we've also adapted to the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And so right. often we, we began to cook foods that were similar, perhaps, to foods that we remembered in Africa mm -hmm. or that our parents remembered from Africa for those who were born in the United States. And many enslaved Africans, of course, were born in the U.S. after the international right. slave trade was stopped. And so many of them had no direct memory of what people were eating in Africa. Right. Right. But, but many of these things were passed down. And, but again, we adapted them to the reality we were faced with. Um, so you've named several of those foods that uh, we popularized in the United States also came from the African continent. There's a couple of interesting books 
that I do want to uh, lift up by a woman named Judith Carney, uh, who actually I met from Dr. Monica White and we did a presentation together in Madison uh, maybe 10 years ago. But um, she wrote a book called Black Rice that yes, talks about, yes. Yes. about how, how the slave traders, the slaves first began as, you know, the trade was a triangular trade. So they first began bringing food from Europe to the West Coast of Africa. And then they would have to wait to fill up the hulls of their ships with captured Africans and then take off of the so Western Hemisphere. Often in the process of waiting, that food would spoil. So that was one problem. The second problem was that often the Africans refused to eat and didn't like the food that was coming mm -hmm. from Europe. So those Europeans began to purchase food from local villages. And one of the foods that they often purchased was rice because the rice can be stored for long periods of time if you don't take the hull off. And you know, many people have seen right. pictures of a video of women in West Africa with mortar and pestle, and they use that for many grains. But what they're doing is taking all of the grains so that you just have the seed. So until you take that hull off, it can be stored for an extraordinarily long period of time. And so the Europeans began buying rice in West Africa and storing it on the ships. And in inevitably, when they got to, to the so-called Western Hemisphere, they would have some rice left over. And that leftover rice became the seed rice that planters were using in South Carolina and the South, the South Sea Islands off the coast of South Carolina to begin the commercial cultivation of rice in the United States. And then because the Europeans had no history themselves of rice cultivation, they began targeting for enslavement Africans from those villages, sometimes in Sierra Leone and other places uh, that yeah. were historically producing rice and began to actually kidnap people, bring them here who had those skills. So it was really the enslaved Africans who taught the European enslavers the skills necessary for growing and cultivating rice. But there were many other foods. And this is the second book Judith Carney wrote. It's called In the Shadow of Slavery. Uh, mm -hmm. And the uh, Subtitle, I forget, something like Atl the Atlantic world, Africa's contribution to the Atlantic world or something like that. But it talks about all the other foods that came across as a result of the slave, so-called slave trade, including cattle. Uh, and I hadn't really thought about that, but there were long -hong, longhorn Fulani cattle that were captured and in the ships. They were mainly used to feed the crew. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, depending on where those ships were going, many of those ships with that cattle from West Africa ended up in Brazil. Brazil is one of now one of the top cattle producing countries in the world, beef producing countries in the world. Many of the cattle are breeding now are the descendants of those Fulani cattle that were brought over on slip ships by the enslavers. Also, off the ships of those uh, cows, those cattle, the goats, you know, they have what they call cloven hoofs. And often yeah. they would have grasses and seeds caught in their hoofs, and that would transport various plants to the so-called Western world. So a number of plants and foodstuffs were brought over across the Atlantic, both intentionally and unintentionally. Um, and so I think it's important that we understand the contribution that Africa has made to the food ways and to the food culture of the United States and the rest of the Western world. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, 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 it's fascinating, but I also, you know, I think it's symbolic of the extent to which the myth about the destruction of African cultures during enslavement has affected us. I mean, you know, I, I think about um, Louis Farrakhan often gave speeches which he talked about everything that was taken from us, which was a old trope that does not stand up to the research since the 80s, right? So yeah, yeah, I think it's important. Um, so let's talk about the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. When was it created? How was it? What does it do? What's been its significance in Detroit? Talk about major accomplishments. I'll start by saying that about 
three months ago, we changed the name of the organization to the Detroit Black Community Food Sovereignty Network. And I'll say ah. briefly that the difference in food security and food sovereignty is food security basically means that people have enough calories, that they're not going hungry. Uh, my friend Raj Patel said to me, once you can have food security in prison. And so clearly what we're striving for is something more than that low bar of people just having enough food to eat. Although in a country as wealthy as America, that bar should almost be met without, without discussion. It's obscene that any, anybody in the United States would be hungry, but that is the case. Um, so food sovereignty is really the condition that exists when a community shapes, defines, and has control of the food system that provides their food. So if you don't make a distinction between food security and food sovereignty, you would probably see it as being progress in a community such as Detroit, which has problems with food access, if Walmart decided they were gonna open a store in Detroit, because it could certainly address the issue of food access, and we could probably assure that most people who could afford it had access to food and would not be hungry, maybe people would see that as progress. But we would have no more control over the food system. We'd have no more control over the millions of dollars of profits that are made each week by Black people in Detroit spending money on food. And we would have no greater power than before the Walmart moved in. And so food sovereignty, again, is the condition that exists when a community shapes and benefits from the food system from which they obtain their food. So the Detroit Black Community Food Sovereignty Network was started in February of 2006. And in many ways, it grew out of some earlier work that we were doing at an African-centered school that I direct, which you referenced earlier in Sodom Institute. We had begun in 1999 at the school, developing a school garden and a food security curriculum that was a school-wide curriculum where all classes in the school had to have at least one lesson per week that had a tie-in to this broad uh, knowledge we were trying to develop in the school around food. So some teachers developed lessons around the economics of food. Some teachers developed lessons around cultural aspects of food. Some teachers develop uh, lessons around the nutritional aspects, uh, aspects of food. And we were trying to, make think, trying to make thinking critically about food and the food system part of the culture at this African-centered mm -hmm. school. And so by about 2005, it became apparent that we needed a larger container to hold the work because parents and people outside of the school community were wanting to participate in this initiative that we had. And so we created the Detroit Black Community at that time, Food Security Network. We were also concerned at that time that most of the key players in Detroit in what was being then called the urban agriculture movement were white-led nonprofit organizations in a city which was the blackest city in North America. So being that I come directly out of uh, this, uh, uh, you know, combination of cultural nationalism and revolutionary nationalism, neither one of those belief systems uh, smiles upon white people coming in the black community and dictating to us and dominating to us what should happen in our own communities. And so in many ways, creating the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network at that time was a pushback against the domination of the space by white-led nonprofits. And we were asserting that in a city where 80% of the population is black, that black people should not only be participating in the food movement, but that we should be leading. Uh, since that time, we've done several things. You mentioned well, 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 let me go back and pick up something. Uh, when you talk about white-led uh, groups that was engaged in, but at that time would have been food security, are you essentially talking about the work of the Boggs Center? Are you talking about a broader movement on the part of the white left? Because I was unaware. I, I was talking about a broader movement, but the box that involved, I wasn't pointing them out specifically. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the boxing at that time certainly wasn't 
uh, white led per se. It had some white leadership, but at that time, Grace Lee Box was still alive, and uh, she was the primary, uh, I, I would say, leader. Uh, you know, if we think about leader in a, a kind of solo way, she was the primary leader, not by herself. But so I wasn't thinking so much of the Box Center, although they were in league with many of the people that I was was mentioning. Now, let me say this in all fairness that those white people who were leading the work, I don't think had any kind of intentional negative intentions. I don't think they came in saying, we're going to try to really dominate the black community. I think they just were active in a space. They had more access to resources. They had more access to connections within various organizations and they were coming doing work. I think their intentions were good, although I don't think most of them had a sharply defined a lens in terms of how race and power play out in American society. So nonetheless, even though they might have had good intentions, it still had the impact of white people coming into black communities, leading things, and uh, us kind of following behind uh, behind uh, people who are defined as white. So, uh, so some of the things that we've done, and I'll go through those very briefly. You mentioned starting the Detroit Food Policy Council. So our position as an organization is that uh, black people should not wait on the government or the corporate sectors to do what has to be done to us towards our liberation. Uh, that we should be the primary liberators of our own. That we should take the initiative to change things to the extent that we're able to. But we also know that it should be responsibly and should create policies that enable people to act in a way that benefits their own interests. And so that was the kind of mind that we went into creating the Detroit Food Policy Council with and developed a very comprehensive document, the Detroit Food Security Policy, that was passed unanimously in 2008 by the Detroit City Council. So although well, it's a very- Can you talk about some of the aspects of that? What are some of the main principles and particular uh, strategies that, that would be embedded in that document? Let me preface that by saying that although it's a beautiful document, I learned a lot about power. And you can have a beautiful policy document that yeah. sits, on, sits on shelves and gathers dust and has no real impact on people's lives. And I think to a large extent, that's what happened with the city of Detroit's food security policy. Um, it's been revised since that time by the current Detroit Food Policy Council. But some of the areas that it addressed, uh, for example, were things like emergency preparedness. What happens in the city of Detroit if there's some some well, some natural disaster, civil disturbance that cuts off the flow of food? How what is the response to that? We uh, addressed school food and school gardens. Uh, we addressed uh, this persistent problem in the city of Detroit of store owners who are members of groups other than the majority African population owning most of the stores and in many cases being disrespectful to the majority black population. Uh, we addressed that. We addressed GMOs, in fact, really called for a ban on GMO foods in the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. Somehow that got passed, but clearly that, makes, that has not happened. So, you know, what I realized is that you can get policy passed, but if you don't have the political strength to really enforce and stay on top of it, then it's just a good policy. And it's similar to what happened when Obama got elected. And I, let me say clearly, it's not, uh, you know, one of those who figured that Obama being elected was going to significantly change our our condition as a people. In fact, I was in league with Angela Davis, who came to Detroit campaigning for Obama, and said that although she was campaigning for him, to be clear that he was running for president of the racist, sexist, imperialist United States of America government. And so, so I wasn't looking at Obama as a, any kind of salvation. But many people did. And then after he was elected, fell off. And so he wasn't able to push forward many of the agendas that had that robust community support been in place, he could have pushed forward. So similar to the EU Policy Council, I don't think the consistent push on the city government for enforcement of those policies was in place. We kind of almost went to sleep once we established the, the council. So there's a lesson in that about persistence 
even once policies are established. Let me, let me let me tease something out there. So on the one hand, you're saying that uh, the Detroit Food Security and Sovereignty Network had the strength politically to get the council to pass this food, this very progressive food policy document, which should have committed them to particular practices. Yes. But then wasn't able to sustain the, the pressure to make it, to realize it, or do you think? Well, yes, that and yeah. let's, let's keep in mind what else was happening in Detroit at that time. Detroit was going through an economic crisis, which by 2013 or so, I think, uh, in fact, no, I think uh, no, I forgot what year. Manager, right? Yeah, there was purchasing manager. I'm forgetting exactly what year, but during the same time period, Detroit was in crisis, and really the city was trying to figure out how to stay solvent. And so, in the midst of a crisis like this, frankly, the food security policy was not on the top of the list. Right. Um, right. And so, so you know, I want to contextualize so both the combination of us not being able to amass and sustain the numbers that it takes to enforce policy once it's in place. And it was the issue of the persistent attacks on Detroit by the state government. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see that. I do want to pose a, a third possibility. Like, my basic analysis is that in the black majority cities where we have black mayors and in cities where we have a black plurality and are able to get a black mayor and substantive representation on the council. But these are neo-colonial processes. And I think one way we see that it's neo-colonial is that the city is immediately in direct conflict with the county and the state because those tend to be whiter entities. Uh, but also a sector of the folk who come into power as black folk in the city perceive their relationship as neo-colonial, meaning that they see themselves as the junior partners of capital and white supremacy, but they don't see themselves as partners to white supremacy, but they are. To what extent was that also a very visible uh, and, and living uh, re reality that y'all confronted? I think there was a dual reality. Uh, there is the reality of Detroit, as you mentioned, having this very strong history of black struggle. And at this time we had two representatives of our movement directly on the city council. Okay. Uh, the Honorable Jennifer Watson was a council member and in fact, she was really our champion as we were pushing the food security policy and the Detroit Food Policy Council forward. And then we had my good brother Kwame Kenyatta, who had been my comrade for many decades and was one of my closest friends, uh, was also city council. And so we had that, but then also you had, you know, Negroes who were in league with the effort to take over the city and disempower Detroit. So both of those realities were happening simultaneously. Yeah, I, th I think that's always the case. You, you know what I mean? All of those forces are in struggle about the same time. Um, so this is more of a personal, <laughs> actually we've been talking about personal issues, but uh, what's the reasoning? You know, like if you were talking to a 13 year old, like you were when, when you joined the movement, how would you explain to them the reasoning behind your decision to make food justice and sovereignty uh, your life's work? Mm. Well, first you of all, let I mean? me clarify. Although I'm working in the food sphere, I don't want to limit people's perception that that's the only work yeah, yeah, I, 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 I know that's, you know, you know, you've got, obviously, you got a very full life and you've been engaged in all aspects of the struggle but I think, you know what, and this might be 
the outside perception that when people think of you, what 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 the the, the mountain of work at the apex of that mountain, what what do they call it? The the summit of the mountain yeah. is the food justice and sovereignty work. So well, for me, for me, that food justice and sovereignty work that was directly tied to the Black Liberation Movement. Okay, so good. I, I always want to I always want to make that clear that it's not the other way around. It's not. I didn't come into food justice because I I read by Greenpeace or you know <laughs> I didn't come into it. From that. I came into it because I heard Malcolm X give give message to the grassroots, and I grew up in a time period when the Nation of Islam had farms, and I would go to the barber shop, and the brothers in the nation was selling newspapers to my black people do for sale, right? So yeah, that's how yeah. I came to it. And so that's the motivation for me, trying to figure out how do we utilize food and agriculture as a way of building black sovereignty, black self-determination. So I want to make that. That's what I was trying to get at. That's what I want want to get at is like some people, you know, we always, all of us are engaged in multiple things, but there's a priority. And, And I was trying to understand why, for example, the bulk of your work didn't go into challenging mass racialized incarceration. The bulk of your work didn't go into trying to find some uh, truly revolutionary folk who would enter the political arena. Why this area? And how does it fit with the rest of the overall goal? So while... Uh, in this time period, maybe the last 20 years, this is one of the prime areas I'm working in. I have worked in those other areas also. I've worked in trying to get progressive people elected to office. I worked in, you know, uh, we had a group called Hope Helping Our Prisoners Elevate. We did bus into the prison program, similar to what the Panthers had. We sent books into prison. So I worked in all of those areas. So again, I, I want to resist kind of being pigeonholed for okay. those 20 years, most of my work has been food related, but for a few reasons. One, uh, many of the schools I've been involved in, our ideological differences or our class differences or our gender differences or our uh, philosophical differences or our religious differences, the thousands of ways that black people find to divide ourselves up, often gets in the middle and things implode and we're not able to build the critical mass that we need to really challenge a white global uh, hegemony. And so I found that food is a great uniter that across, uh. it, it crosses theological lines. So you can have an integrationist and a, a, a black nationalist who both agree that we need good quality food in the black community. You can have a Baptist and a Muslim who both agree that we need good quality food in the black community. You have a, a transsexual and a raging patriarch who both agree that we need food in the black community. So it, it becomes a uniter across many of the differences that often cause us to splinter. That's one reason it's important. The second reason is that it's just fundamental to life. And we're talking about building Black sovereignty, however people might conceptualize that. And, you know, there, I don't want to get off into a long discussion, but there's various But I do want you to say something about how you conceptualize sovereignty and how it fits okay. in to your broader political okay. philosophy and practice. Okay, I'll try, I'll try to come back to that. Um, okay. But as uh, we're trying to build this greater self-reliance and, and, and minimize the dependence we have on others, food becomes fundamental. Uh, and I think, you know, we have examples like Fannie Lou Hamm, you know, said something like, if you got, you know, you got some food stored up for the winter and you got a pig, they can't push you around. And yeah. so I'm paraphrasing, of course, what she said, but essentially that's true. If we can't provide this most basic life-sustaining uh, need for ourselves, then we find ourselves in a tremendously dependent situation. So for that reason, food is important. Even as we look historically at the development of human civilizations, you know, many people point to ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt as 
perhaps in some ways the apex of cultural development uh, in many ways, uh, but certainly the the cultural development that occurred in ancient Kemet could not have occurred without agriculture. In fact, uh, one of our elders who recently became an ancestor, Brother Tariq Oduno, often said that there is no culture without agriculture. And so as long as people were trying to figure out how do we get a food to eat, they didn't have enough time to explore the mysteries of the universe, to develop mathematical systems, to begin to develop geology and martial arts. All that stuff comes once you got food in your stomach and you're not chasing food all day, every day. And so similarly, as we seek to reestablish our black civilization, however people might conceptualize that, or to reestablish our place in the world as uh, you know, human beings who are to respect, mm -hmm. uh, who are to move with dignity, and who are to have control over our own lives, then food has to figure prominently into that, you know, as we're kind of reestablishing ourselves. So that, those are some of the reasons that I, I put a lot of energy into this food struggle. Now, one of the things you haven't talked about is that uh, you guys, I mean, you've got a farm, you've got community gardens, but now you're opening up a uh, grocery store. Can you yeah. talk about that and, and, and its significance? Sure. So since 2010, we've been working on opening a cooperatively owned grocery store. And let me say clearly that our organization is an anti-capitalist organization. I don't believe, and our organization doesn't believe, that there is any freedom for Black people that is going to coexist side by side with capitalism. And yeah. so the dismantling of capitalism is a necessary prerequisite for Black freedom, no matter which of the routes you choose to take. And again, you know, there's limited routes we can take. There's those who believe great, you know, those some, some folks who feel like they should go back to Africa. There are some folks who feel like we need territorial separation of kind of the new African independence movement philosophy. There's some folks who believe as the Panthers did that perhaps black folks can have a more fair shake inside of a, a post-revolutionary America where some of these systems that create vast inequality have been dismantled. But whichever of those routes we take, there is no black freedom side by side existing with capitalism. And yeah. so we want to be clear about that. So for us, we were always interested in co-ops because co-ops in a sense become the microcosm of what a larger socialist society mm -hmm. might look like. And so we're trying to break the monopoly on our thing that capitalism has and challenge how people see our relationship to economy. And so co-ops become a way of challenging that relationship and simultaneously pointing the way forward, which is the more collective, uh, co cooperative way that values and prioritizes human well-being over profit. And so we were always interested in a co-op specifically for those reasons. You know, even in the Black community, a lot of times, even since the times of Marcus Garvey, we hear about buy Black campaigns. And while generally I think that's those are good ideas, you know, people who are as underdeveloped as we are, or a national grouping that is underdeveloped as we are, there is some benefit in even just having black businesses. But right. we should right. be clear. We should be clear though that simply having a business owned by a black person does not translate necessarily into some larger benefit for the black community. Um, in fact, yeah. there, are, there are instances where there are black business owners who uh, who have um a sense of um disdain for the communities that they're operating with operating in in the same way that white people arabs and some or some asian people have disdain for black communities there are uh, black merchants who open businesses and the only benefit that is derived from that business is that some sons or daughters go to college and they have a nice house and a nice car it doesn't necessarily translate into collective benefit for our communities. That's and so true. we are pushing cooperative economics because we see that as being the only way that we can build, the, get, that we can galvanize kind of collective or economically, politically, culturally, that we need to transform our communities. So um, that's why I co-op. So we've been working on this for uh, going on, uh, for 13 years now, 
and we're a few months before opening uh, in April. We expect to open the Detroit People's Food Co-op, which is a grocery store owned currently by more than 2,100 community members in the city of Detroit. And we are careful in how we phrase it, how we term it. We say it's a Black-led, community-owned grocery store. We say it like that because the leadership of the co-op is Black, but it's open to all residents to join. Right. And so we have residents who are non-Black. We are making very strong efforts to ensure that the leadership and a focus on uplifting the Black community becomes embedded in the fabric of the co-op so that five years from now, 10 years from now, when the current leadership is not there, that that will become, that won't be up for question, that that will be always part of the purpose of this co-op. We also, though, built the new building that the co-op is located in. We built a building called the Detroit Food Commons, which is a brand new 31,000 square foot, two-story building located on Detroit's main street, Woodward Avenue at a cross street called Oakland Avenue. Interestingly, right across the street from where the Algiers Book Institute occurs that I referred to earlier. So right in the heart of Detroit's black community. And it's significant in multiple ways on the fact that we are challenging the capitalist notion of how we obtain food through a cooperative is uh, important. But also the fact that this building that we built was built by two black organizations, the Detroit Black Community Food Science Network and our development partner, Develop Detroit Incorporated. There, um, so I've heard many people say, that? What does that mean? Does that mean you financed it? Does that mean that these organizations supplied black workers who were paid a living wage? What, what, what does you built it mean? What do you, Thank you for you, clarifying that. Uh, let me say what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we were out there with hammers and drills okay. doing the construction. <laughs> We hired a construction company. We had a black owned construction company um, called uh, uh, S. Brinker Company, who is actually managing the construction process. Right. Some of the construction they do themselves in house have companies under the Brinker Company. And so they do some of the drywalling and some of the other trades. But then some of the trades, you know, happens in construction is the general contract bids them out. Uh, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure if they're if they're union or not. I'm not positive. Okay. Uh, but again, but they're, they're and, hiring black workers and paying a, well, a fair wage. Well, I haven't got to that yet. Now, let me, that's yeah. another question. It was a okay. black-owned company. So, in my naivety, I assumed that you hire a black general contractor. That means you're gonna see a bunch of black people working on the building. That was not the. Case. So it was a big wake-up call for me. So, and again, what I realized happens is that the general contractor bids out most of the work. And so yep. the electrical work, they bid it out and they put the specs out and whoever comes in with the best price and can see like they do the job, that's who gets hired. So yep. I spared black people actually working on the project. In fact, every time I saw a black person, I went up to them, shook their hand, found out what their name was. And so in, in partial defense, of L.S. Brinker, the general contractor, I will say that there's three young black people that they are training to be in leadership that have often been part of the, the, the process. In fact, the, um, the, the construction engineer is a young black woman uh, who were very few, where uh, Imari Obadele taught for a number of years. Um, and some of the other leadership that's being trained are young black people, but most of the people, frankly, working on the project were either white or Mexican. So it was a, a big wake up call for me. Brother, um, you, you know, when Obama put the money into uh, construction and uh, the whole thing, you know, about having shovel ready projects and Joe Biden, I, I saw some research that said that the construction industry, the employees are only 6% black in those trade unions. And so we're such a small percentage that I'm not surprised that you rarely saw a black woman. Again, that's another piece of the work that we got to do. Is. It is. But just saying we had a black architectural company. Well, yeah. but the architect who was actually assigned to the project was white. So, again, I had a lot of misconceptions that I had 
you know, shake up as I'm seeing the reality of how life in capitalist America really unfolds. <laughs> and often, often it's not in this nice little box with red, black, green bow on it like we would like it to be. It's, it can be right. it can be kind of messy. So I learned a lot by doing this project. So when I say we built it, I mean is that we uh, amassed the twenty one point six million dollars that it took to build this thing, and we got about six million dollars in grants from local philanthropy. Uh, there's a whole story behind that though about the black women in positions who were meeting and conspiring on our behalf to make that money happen. Uh, then we got uh, maybe about $1 million in donations, including a pretty sizable donation by a former Detroit Lions football player who, oh, really, who really didn't even want to have it publicized. He wanted to just do it kind of on low key and um, not really talk about it, which, show, which also opened my eyes to a lot. Because, you know, we often criticize athletes and entertainers and say, oh, they're not doing nothing to help the black community. Well, sometimes we don't know who's doing what, to tell you the truth. That's right. That's right. His brother showed me, because he wasn't interested in having his picture in the paper. He wasn't interested in the press conference. He was just interested out of the goodness of his heart in contributing to this project. And he made a very significant contribution. Uh, but then the rest of it, about uh, $14 million is debt financing. So it's similar to- What does that mean? That means like if you go to buy a car and the car costs thirty thousand dollars, and you don't have thirty thousand dollars. They say, "Oh, we'll loan you thirty thousand dollars, and you pay us back over the next X number of years at X amount of interest." And so okay. that's what debt financing is. And so most of that project is debt financing. It's loans that we have that we have to pay back over time. And so, okay. uh, so that means that we now have the awesome task of running viable businesses in this space. That are going to be able to generate money and pay back this money that we uh, that we were loaned. Okay. Good. Oh, this is what I want to see though. On the second floor, we have the grocery store on the first floor of the building. On the second floor, we have four shared use commercial kitchens that we'll be renting out to food entrepreneurs. We have a three thousand square foot community meeting space slash banquet hall, which is called the Mama Imani Humphrey Hall which is named after uh, Mama Imani Humphrey, who created Aisha Shule, the first independent black uh, school in the city of Detroit in modern times, at least. And I say modern times because the Nation of Islam had schools in the 1930s. But during the modern, the 1970s, um, she created Aisha Shule, the first African-centered school, and also the mother of Brother Michael C. Mongo, who you might know. Yes, is, yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Scholar who was living in Atlanta for many yeah. years, so we're naming them all after her, and so uh, we have to make those things now cash flow positively. And we, on top mm -hmm. of that, on top of having to make them cash flow positively, we have an awesome task of still making them accessible to our community. So one of the things I'm doing now, like we have an end of the year fundraising campaign going on for Detroit Black Food Community Detroit Community Food Sovereignty Network, and one of the things we're raising money for now. It's called the Detroit Food Commons Community Accessibility Fund because we want to make sure that the prices we have to charge for rental of the spaces yeah. don't exclude grassroots community organizations. So we're yeah. putting together this fund so that we can make sure our bills are paid still that grassroots community members have access to this facility. I love it, man. You know, uh, that, we need that going in uh, every community at a high level. Um, I, I got one more kind of question for you, and then there's a couple of questions. I think we got a vicious troll in here that we have to respond to. Um, so I was looking at some some statistics, and you know, I, I think this is the stuff that uh, slow genocide is made of, structural violence. So in 2022. 29% or nearly one third of black children and one in five or 20% of black adults, totaling nearly 9 million black folk lived in food insecure households. Essentially, they lived in food deserts community. Do you think this reality is at the forefront 
of radical black organizations and movements agenda? And if not, why not? Uh, no, I don't think it's at the forefront. And one thing I try to do is bring it more to the forefront of various formations within the what I broadly call the Black Freedom Movement. Um, but it's a serious it's a serious thing. But again, you know, Dara Cooper, my friend Dara Cooper, who you know, uh, often says you only get correct answers if you ask the correct questions. <laughs> and so, um, I would assert that one of the reasons that we have this rate of hunger in our community is because we don't have food sovereignty and food and self-determination. Right. The mechanisms that we had in our community to produce food and distribute and share food among ourselves have been largely destroyed. And those are mechanisms that I'm referring to primarily in the South. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we know the history of terrorism that has separated black people from land that we owned. Uh, we know the history of redlining and the destruction of black business districts throughout the United States. All of these things have contributed to a situation where we are more vulnerable and find ourselves almost at the mercy of other ethnic groups who, again, have greater access to capital, who perhaps have a greater honorial history and um, have more favor by uh, the banking, uh, the, the kind of the bank industry. And so, uh, so we find ourselves in a situation where other people are controlling the, the, it's the last, in fact, other people are controlling the whole process from seed to the time the food gets on our, yeah. on our tables. But let, let me raise a question. Um, you know, growing up, um, my grandparents kept a garden. And, you know, as kids, we all were required to work. It was, a, you know, like a, a full lot long space that we were forced to work. And in the entirety of the black community on the South side, it was rare to find a family, because these were, you know, Southern migrants. It was rare to find a family that did not have a garden, did not grow apples, apricots, grapes. You, you, you know what I mean? And that was growing up in the 60s, you literally could get a meal walking through an alley in any part of the black community on the South side. We kids resented working in that garden. Um, subsequently, as our grandparents got too old to work in that garden, and I can only assume that our parents resented it because they didn't keep up the gardens, this faded away. And, and that wouldn't have solved the problems we have, but it certainly would have made a, a dent into self-reliance, better quality of what we were consuming. Um, how do we, in the, in, the, in, the, in the North, now I love Charles Bowles' arguments, essentially the RNA, actually it's Edward McCabe's plan from the 1890s, right? Mm -hmm. And Floyd McKissick was making a similar argument. Um, I haven't heard that name in a while. Soul City, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, he did this book called Three-Fifths of Man, and he made this argument that at the time I thought was completely insane. He said that within the U.S. federal system, we could find large measures of self-determination if we became the majority population in three or four states. So he's talking about, you know, states' rights. And then the argument would be if we control the state, we would be in, we would be in conflict largely with the white state, the white federal government, and our position might be states' rights. <laughs> At any rate, but how do we deal with this, this, this notion that we got to reorient ourselves back to the notion of the, of the land and, and the value of being self-reliant. So I think there's two things that we have to consider. 
first is our own particular history. And so my friend Leah Peniman says the land is the scene of the crime. Black people still have a lot of trauma related to the for, our forced labor as enslaved workers, as sharecroppers and tenant farmers. And so um, many Black people want to get as far away from those memories as possible. Yeah. You know, even those who didn't experience it, they have this kind of almost intergenerational uh, memory where working the land is devalued. And in fact, um, you know, our experience has been at Detail Farm that almost any time we have a group of young people come out to the farm to work, within the first 15 minutes, we're going to hear some reference to slavery. Because this is the mm. mindset that we, or the, the lens through which we view our agricultural work. Usually we hear jokes like, hurry up, why? I'm going to work you like a slave, or I thought slavery was over. There's some mention of slavery, usually within the first 15 minutes, because that is the mindset, even in our children today, who didn't grow up enslaved, and whose parents weren't enslaved, and whose grandparents were there, this has still been passed down through the culture. The same is true, you know, I have a very good friend who works with Caribbean youth in Toronto, and he has the exact same experience. Because yeah. of the enslavement of our ancestors, there's a very negative connotation associated with agricultural work. So, so can I ask for why? Yes. So this is a challenge that I don't even want to say it's particular to black people because I also met a Mexican sister who shared a similar story to me on how her grandmother discouraged her from becoming a farmer. Again, because of how they were exploited and the trauma associated with farming. So it's uh, definitely, uh, I don't say particular to African people in America, but it definitely impacts people of African descent in the Western hemisphere, perhaps impacts others also who've had similar experiences with exploitation. Um, but the second factor is a more universal fact, and that is almost globally, there's a tension between urban life and rural life. And yeah. there's this feeling that somehow urban life is cooler, hipper, more sophisticated, uh, that you're, you know, somehow if you're from the country, you're somehow less. In fact, growing me growing up, the last thing anybody wanted to know was country. You know, if your if your pants were a little bit too, the cuffs were a little too high, people call you country. Nobody wanted to be called country. Everybody wanted to be yeah. slick, cool, city fried. And so this is a global phenomenon. Uh, now, part of it is that the way global capitalism works is that capital tends to be located in these city, in and around these cities. And right. so there also tends to be more jobs in and around cities. And so people draw often from the countryside where yeah. with lots of hard work, perhaps they could uh, subsist and, you know, and not be hungry. They might not really flourish, uh, but then they figure they can go to the city and, and get in the, become a wage laborer and, you yeah. know, have a pay every week or whatever. So this is a draw across the world. So we have both the, the tension of uh, African people, people of African descent in the so-called hemisphere, having negative views about agriculture because of our enslavement and sharecropping. And we have the global phenomenon of people moving from the countryside into cities uh, because of the law of the cities. Okay, and so we, we clearly, one answer. Yeah, and so clearly as we're moving towards, for those of us who desire greater self-reliance for uh, black people in the United States, clearly lifting up agriculture and the production distribution and sale of the food that we consume has to be a, fun, a fundamental part of our movement. Again, uh, thank, I really appreciate that answer. Uh, we got 12 minutes. I want to turn to some of the questions. But first, I want to deal with this troll. Um, the troll is making a, a false representation of Malcolm X's life. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that they're basing it on the Manny Marable book, um, A Life of Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention. And what the troll, Negus Afro Dem Dow, who also refers to us as orangutans, 
the, the troll argues that Malcolm X was a bisexual man. Uh, all Black Panther males were bisexual. It's, it's, and again, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with someone being gay, uh, any of that spectrum of, of queerness, but the evidence doesn't fit Malcolm's life, even in the Marable book. You know, certain things are made clear. So, and then the, the, the reference that Malcolm was like Andrew Gillum. So at any rate, there's this, this troll. But I just wanted to respond to that because you can't leave this shit out there. So I wanna, uh, one of the questions that was raised specifically to you is about, the, the question is something to the effect that, do you see the carnivore diet as an industry-sponsored psyop? I don't know what a scion is. Let me start with that. Psyop. Maybe you can explain it. Oh, it's psyop. a psychological operation to uh, prepare a population for exploitation, oppression, genocide. Okay, psyop. Okay, I've heard of that before. Yeah. Well, let, let me let me approach this answer gingerly, um, because on one. So I'm a vegan. My personal. That's my personal dietary path. It has served me well. Uh, I've, I haven't personally eaten meat since 1975, but I'm not on a mission to convince black people to stop eating meat because I think it's an exercise in futility for all. Um, and especially chicken. Black people are not going to stop eating chicken. I don't care what you say, <laughs> what you do. So let's come, let's come to grips with that, okay? So we're going to have to figure out how, to, how, how do the vegans coexist with the chicken eaters because that's a reality. <laughs> Um, but I do think that there's plenty of evidence to suggest that human health would be improved as well as the health of the planet yeah. by the reduction of the amount of meat that we consume. And while I think that many human societies for thousands of years have consumed meat, meat has been the primary, the center of the diet. And so this also has class implications. Uh, this kind of meat centric diet is, uh, a diet of the European aristocracy. And so what we find is that people associate the ability to eat meat with wealth. And yeah. that the, the more you know meat you can have or the primer cuts of meat that you can have, the more status you have. And we find that throughout the world, as developing countries begin to adopt more American and westernized culture, which includes the increased consumption of meat, we're finding that they're beginning to have many of the related diseases that we see running rapid throughout the United States. So while I, I'm not on a mission to convert people to veganism, I think that the planet and human health would be served by us reducing the amount of meat that we consume and by uh, increasing the amount of fresh fruits, nuts, uh, whole grains and vegetables that we consume. Now, whether or not the Government is, you know, whether or not a, an operation to, you know, I don't, I mean, clearly we know that the meat industry and the dairy industry is a tremendous lobby and there are tremendous amounts of money <laughs> by the addiction that people have to meat and dairy products. Uh, and we also know that the government, the United States government and industrial farming are in bed together and people move seamlessly from the government into Monsanto and these other corporations that control industrial farming. So um, I, I think the government sees it in their interest to kind of continue the standard American diet. I think they're motivated, motivated as they are in most ways by profit and they have very little concern for human life. You know, you know, um, I would resonate. I do resonate with everything you said, but I want to push you on, 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 on a, on a piece. Um, I see that a lot of our people is not a matter of just meat consumption. It's a matter of fast food consumption. And that because of poverty and because of the strategic locational decisions of uh, the fast food capitalist industry the McDonald's, surrounding our neighborhoods, that uh, that food and the processed meats are worse and have a worse impact 
and that if we could at least mitigate that, but they're so cheap. You, you know, I mean, that's, that's, and we're so poor, that's how we end up caught in, 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 in that vice. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. So several things I want to say about that. The meat we're eating today is not the same our ancestors were eating 100 years ago. Uh, well, 50 I, years ago. Yeah, well, even 50 years ago. When we, you know, when we were on farm and, you know, people were butchering food and, it, you know, you yeah. eat it within a few hours, whatever. Without all these chemicals and additives, you know, it was much less harmful for us than yeah. what we're consuming today. Um, the other thing that I'll say about that, though, um, if you recall around 1972 when uh, Nixon was president, and I think it's around the same call the time that Floyd McKissick was doing the Soul City, and there were other calls, kind of, you know, Black Power was still kind of, it was dying out, but there's still calls for Black Power, and Nixon called for Black Power, if you recall. Oh, yes, he did. But he and defined yes, he it as Black capitalism. Yes, that's right. And he, he created he pr he pushed uh, the ownership, black ownership of fast food restaurants as the kind of low hanging fruit and as a way for people to get into black capitalism. And so one of the reasons that we saw the proliferation of black food, black fast food owned restaurants in black cities was because of the initiative pushed by uh, by Richard Nixon. You know, I had, I had studied the whole Nixon thing because I've done a lot with Soul City in my research. But I didn't realize that he had pushed them toward the fast food industry. I just knew that, you know, a lot of black folks got McDonald's franchises. Um, fewer got Burger King and probably very few got Wendy's. But the, but the point was that, yeah, that became a nodal point. And it's still a, a nodal point. And people think of the McDonald's in black communities as a, a kind of... Um, anchor institution now. Yeah. 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 And, and you're absolutely right. The food, the quality of the food, because you're mass producing, you're storing, you're transporting thousands of miles. Uh, I, the best we could call this stuff is food-like or food-ish. Yeah, um, there you go. And there so, you go. And so it's, a, it's a terrible problem, not just in uh, Black communities, but really around the world. We're seeing, even on the African continent and in the so-called developing of the world, the intrusion of these fast food restaurants. And the same thing happening that we see happening here, that because these foods are also highly engineered, let me say that. These yeah. foods, they're science, they are scientists who study the amount of salt, the amount of sugar, the texture of the food, and they make it almost irresistible. They've studied the science of oh, it. Right. And that's, study, that's, the, that's the science. Yeah, okay. Okay, so yeah, that's that for sure that's going on. and. Um, and so people are literally addicted to the, these tastes and textures that are in the in the fast foods. And so we have to break that addiction. And one of the ways we break it is by going back to eating whole foods and actually understanding what real foods taste like. That, 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 is, that is true. Um, okay, we're, we're coming to uh, the, the end. I'm not seeing, I'm seeing more statements than questions, but I just have an observation. Um, I've traveled to a number of places outside of the US, and what I've seen, even in Europe, is that uh, they tend to go to the store and buy food every day or every couple of days. We tend to buy food for a couple of weeks and freeze it. And so I think that, you know, even within this global capitalist initiative, you, you see that the EU does not allow certain American foods into the entirety of, of, of Europe because of the GMOs and, 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 and all of that. But also the, the tendency that you don't hoard, you, you go just go to the store every day or every two days so you get fresher food. Anyway, so that, that uh, any last comments? Uh, that that you yeah. uh, want to say, my brother. Yeah, I just want to say that you know, whenever we're analyzing our problem, as you know, we can't divorce it from the economic system that we're functioning within. We don't exist independently of that. And so, in the post World War II period, where you know we had women going to work in World War II, 
working in the factories, Rosie the Riveter and all of that. And then after that, we have many more women in the workforce. So this is the era I was born in, right? Where my mother mm -hmm. and father worked, you know, time. Mm -hmm. And so you had all these conveniences that were introduced. So, you know, I grew up, TV dinners were, that, that was like a treat. We have TV dinner or hot pie. Or, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or rice. All these things were introduced because women were not in the workforce. And since they were the primary preparers of food in the home, they didn't want to spend or couldn't spend all that time that they were spending prior on food preparation. And so both the introduction of fast foods, right. also a lot of these kind of convenience foods came out of the World War II era. But again, it's directly connected to the economic system. We don't exist independently of that. That in many ways shapes what happens even inside of our homes. Absolutely. But, you know, uh, we could have responded by men participating more in the pre food preparation. Yeah, well, I would say in some, some cases so, we did. You know, I'll, say, I'll say in my family, you know, because my mother and father both worked at the post office, often on Saturdays, for example, when my mother was working, my father prepared food. And, you know, and so, I think that, that is a trend that black men certainly have done much more of that than any other class of men. But even still, uh, I guess I'm arguing that we we're going to have to do more. Because the, somehow we've got to resist within this, within this, we got to resist this targeting that makes us more vulnerable to the fast, to the fast food, to the worst excesses of U.S. capital. Hmm. And and you know what also happens is that when a people are oppressed, and when like in our situation, not only are we oppressed, but the very fiber of what makes us recognize our own humanity much of that has been taken away from us you know other oppressed people they usually still are on their traditional land they're speaking their traditional language they are eating the foods their grandparents ate they they may be oppressed, but they how they get into the human you know kind of into human yeah. geography and so we, we have this tremendous problem that other people have not been faced with to the extent that we're that we're faced with it um and so when you when you're searching for meaning and searching for things that give you worth and 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 to to be able to cope in the world things that stimulate your pleasure centers are more you know if you're oppressed the more oppressed you are the more you're looking for those things to bring you some joy so if you eat a hamburger that's been engineered to send dopamines to your brain then you know you're more apt to do that if you're more oppressed and marginalized. No, absolutely. And I think the, the guy who said that about PSYOPs, I think that was, was what he was getting at. And you've explained it wonderfully. Well, for, forgive me for not being as familiar with the, the language. Uh, brother, but you, you laid out the concept beautifully. So uh, we, we've reached that point and uh, I'm going to, take you, re remove you, and I'm going to uh, play uh, the credits and go uh, and, and end the program. But, uh, you okay. know, just hang around, but I'm, 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 I'm removing you, and I am...